Now let's consider loyalty. Okay. So there is a comic book with the name Liar King, also the drama, but uh, it's not so related to that. But uh, this question is actually related to one of the POW problem, which was on recently. Anyway, let's consider the following game. So you have a Paul and Carol. So what we do is Carol picks a number X from 0 and 1 and Paul asks a yes no question and Q times and after that Paul wants to determine what Carol's number X is. If Paul can determine, then Paul wins. If not, Carol wins. In that case, when Paul wins and when Carol wins, oh, one of the problem on this setup is that uh, it can be determined by in a lucky way. So Carol's number is 1, and then Paul happened to be asking the first question as, uh, is your number 1? Then you are done, right? So we want to get rid of this randomness, and we want to make it to a game that uh, one player always has a winning strategy. Then what we do is we can add the uh, assumption that Carol can lie. I'm oh, no, sorry, Carol can change num number Carol initially think x as 1 but uh, when Paul asks is your question 1 then she says no and she changed it to other number because she didn't tell to anyone then now I mean she can change the number as long as she her previous answers remain true. Then this actually give us give you a game where the one player has the winning strategy. It's not difficult to show that uh, if n is m of 2 to the q, then Paul wins. If n is bigger than 2 to the q, then Carol always wins. <coughs> Simply because in order to figure out this number, we need 2 to the, I mean, rogue and bits of information. But uh, in each question, you get one bit. So all the information you can get is 2 to the, I mean, qubits of information. So you compare these two numbers, and then, I mean, you can decide which one to add to it. But what if we can make the game more interesting to add an assumption that the uh, Carol can lie at most k times. <coughs> so for example, Carol has a number 1 and then Paul asks, is your number 1? And she says no. Then in the normal game, now 1 is excluded and then the Carol has to I mean, change her number to some other number on her mind. But the now, I mean, at most k lies are okay. So at the end, I mean, she picks her number and Paul guesses. And if Paul guesses the wrong number and then Carol declares her x is some, some number, but uh, which violates almost K of her previous answer, but still that's okay. So still, Carol wins. Then, how can we actually decide whether, I mean, Carol wins or Paul wins? <coughs> so, 
let's make this as the following chip layer game so assume there exists a board with position 0, 1, 2, k so it's like a board game 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 There are n chips which are labeled with the uh, numbers 1 to n which are initially at position k so you have like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 here say and there are q rounds on each round pole actually selects a set f of the chips and carol can either move every chip not in S one position below or move every chip in S one position below and chips moved below zero below the position zero will be removed from the board And what we care is the after Q rounds. Carol wins if there is more than one ship. Remaining on the board. And Paul wins. If there is at most one, one or zero chip. So you can consider this as a, I mean, in the previous set, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven are all there. And now Paul asks whether S, I mean, your X is in one or two or three and carol says yes that means if this was uh, one of the po i mean one of the number between four five six seven then this first question was lie that means if later Carol haven't decided the whole number yet. If later Carol decides that uh, this was your number, then there was no lie, and th th this is her number, then there is this one lie. And since we can lie, I mean Carol can lie at most k times, it's still okay. And now Paul asks whether your X is in say one, four, five. Now Carol says yes. Then if it is two, three, or six, seven, then the second one was lie. And 
Okay, this buy was uh, not, a not a good idea. Let's say 0, 1, 2. And the third question is whether your x is in 1, 2, 6. And Carol says, yes. That means if this was 3, 4, 5, it was right. If it was 7, this was right. So if her final answer is 7, then she already lied 3 times. So it's more than 2, So which is k. So 7, if she later changed to 7, then she lose and poor win. So this is no longer an available choice for Carol. And Paul asks whether x is in 3, 4, 5, 6. And she says, no. That means if it is, it is one of these, you lose. I mean, one of these, then this was a lie, so it goes below. So if, your answer, if Carol's number is one of these, then her number of lies is more than two, so you are done. So you do this. After Q lounge, if there are still two numbers here, then whatever Paul decides, Carol can decide the other. So I didn't specify here. At the end, Paul guesses, and then after that, Carol still can change her number. And Carol decides the uh, I mean, her number. If Paul's number and Carol's number are same, then Paul win. And if this is different, but the sh that makes her lie more than k times, then still Paul win. Carol wins only if two numbers stay, I mean, Paul's guess is wrong, and the number of lies she did is at most k. So in that setup, so the, it is, it's easy to see that this chip liar game is actually equivalent with this liar game. <coughs> so, now what can we prove? How can we guess what n and q, which one might win and which one might not win? So as before, 2 to the q is the number of information we can gather. And there was n choices. But now, once you guess your number correctly, then you know the number as well as at which point Carol lied. You also know that, right? You also automatically know this. So you have to compare this number with the, the cases she didn't lie. So she could lie once out of this twin, out of this Q, and she could lie twice, and she could have lied k times. So this Q string must, this Q bits must contain the information about n as well as information about where did Carol lie. So if the information on here is bigger than Q, then probably, I mean, Paul cannot really decide the number exactly. In that case, Carol always wins. So, guess is if n times q0, qk is bigger than, say, 2 to the q, then Carol wins. So this is somewhat I mean, intuitive. And more generally, I mean, we can actually prove the stronger theorem than this. We can, I mean, 
More generally, here all the chips are at the position K, but that's really not necessary. There are no need to put all chips on the same position. So, let's say you define x0, xk, comma q, chip layer game. Meaning that the, there are q round, and then x0 chips on the position 0, x1, xi chips on the position i. Let p, q, j be the 2 to the minus q, summation i equal 0 to q, q i. So, this is exactly the probability that in q coin flips of a fair coin, there are at most j hat. Then, well, I mean, the generalization of this theorem can be written as uh, if we have uh, xi many of them and we multiply each of them, uh, this probability of at most i coin flip, i has in q coin flip. If this is bigger than 1, then Carol wins this x1, I mean x0, comma, x1, comma, xk, comma, q, chip layer game. <coughs> so let's prove. Note that uh, this is, uh, I mean, because we have shaped the uh, game in such a way that uh, it is perfect information game. And there is no draw. So one has a winning strategy. So, what we have to show is that the pole does not have a winning strategy. Enough to show that pole has no winning strategy. Then automatically, Carol has a winning strategy. So, assume us, I mean, so now we want to show that every strategy of pole is not perfect. So, fix the strategy of pole. So, we fix the strategy of pole, and now we show that the uh, Carol has a possibility to win. And so, we want to show that this strategy is not perfect. So, now Carol play randomly. So in each round, Paul selects a Paul selects a set S of chips. Then what do you do? Carol flips a coin. Which is a fair coin. If it comes up as head, comes up with head, then move all chips in S down. If it is tail, then move all chips not in S down one position down. So this is totally random. 
for each C, which is a chip, let IC be the indicator random variable. For C remaining on the board. at the end of the game. Then, no matter what set S Paul picked, in each round, the probability that the, this chip C moves down by one is probability half. Because if it's head, then you move all the chips in S if it is tail, then you move all the chips not in S. So, whether this chip S, C, chip C is in S or not, it always has a probability half to actually go down. And let X be the summation of this IC, which indicates the number of balls that's remaining on the I mean, number of chips that's remaining on the board at the end of the game. <clears throat> then, what's the expected number of this IC? The priority that the C remains in here is actually BQI. If C starts at position I. So by the linearity of expectation, expectation of X is summation of expectation of IC. And how many chips are on position I, XI? So this is bigger than one. So what can we conclude? X being bigger than one must occur with probability positive. That means Paul cannot always win. There is positive probability that the Carol wins. <laughs> then there is no perfect strategy of Paul. So Carol wins. But you might consider that uh, this proof is not so good because it shows that there exists a way that a carol win. But uh, what is the strategy? We can actually de-randomize. How do we do it? Simply as before, if you have uh, some position, board position, 0, 1, 2, 3, it's contains x0, x1, x2, x3 chips, then you consider the weight. Weight of this board position P <coughs> is summation of xi, P, qi, which is the probability, no, not probability, expected number of chips remaining on the board if so let's give me a moment q prime i and let's say q prime turns remaining So assume we have a default position and then we play Q prime turn, turns. Then let's say we give this weight. Then from here, if you play the remaining Q turns in a random way, then what's the expected number of chips? We play from P, Q prime rounds. Then, you are given at a certain position. 
then Paul calls S. Then you compute the two possible situations. So you said yes or no. So you move move the chips on S or move the chips on S complements. You consider these two situations. So this is bold position P, then bold position P1 and bold position P2. Then what's the current weight? You compute this weight for each bold position, Carol. Then this bold position is because of this interpretation. This is exactly half times the say Q turns remaining, half times the P1, Q minus 1, plus half times the P2, Q minus 1. So that means this is exactly the average of these two. So one of the this choice, there exists i such that this weight actually increase. Then Carol compute this and then choose the one which increase this. So you start from the initial ball position. So okay, let me say increase or stay. And you do this at the end when this is zero. And this is exactly the number of chips remaining at the end of the game. And we initially said that this is at least bigger than one, so this is at least two. Then Carol wins. So by de-randomizing this proof, we can come up with this weight function, which has that in each board position, whatever pole calls, which is S, there are two possible next board position. And the weight for those board position is, uh, I mean, their average is the initial board position. So you can actually choose one of these two choices, which benefits you, I mean, Carol. So that gave us a simple, perfect strategy for Carol. And before ending the video, let me mentioned that the converse of this theorem is not actually true because if you consider the 0, 5, 5 chip layer game, so you have a board position. Only two. There are five chips here. Then what's P51 is 6 over 32 and there are 5 of them which is actually smaller than this. So 5 times P51 is more than 1. But still Carol win. Because whatever Paul says, if we select two chips, so S has size 2 then Carol moved the two chips down. If S has size at least three, I mean, say, then Carol keeps the all move chips outside of S down. Then the next bold position is this. Here we have three, and here we have two. With the four remaining rounds. But in this case, what? 2 times 4, 0, plus 3 times B4, 1, is, if you compute it, it's actually bigger than 1. From here, Carol can play, then Carol will win. The problem here was that the pole had uh, no good move because of this being odd. So pole cannot really push down exactly half, so there are some I mean, after Paul, Paul says, Carol can push down the way she want. So in a sense, the initial 
weight was bigger, I mean, smaller than one. But uh, whatever Paul says, the one of next two was actually strictly bigger than before. So that the, and once it's over one, it's bigger than one, then Carol can actually have a strategy to keep it over one by keep choosing the ones which increase or stays the weight. So the converse doesn't hurt.